Our devotional today is about loving and forgiving, or should it be forgiving and loving, whichever comes first, we'll see. And we'll also briefly, di briefly discuss how praying for someone first may make it easier to love them and to forgive them. Our scripture references address all three of these indispensable activities. In one reference, Jesus tells us the two greatest commandments are loving God and then loving others. And in other scriptures, we're told to forgive in order to be forgiven by our Lord. And in still other scriptures, we are told to pray without ceasing. The subjects of love, forgiveness, and prayer are especially appropriate this year, given the level of anger and bitterness evident in our country in the lead up to the November election and continuing now, even as we speak, and continuing around the world as well because of increasing violence, the COVID pandemic, natural disasters, and other causes. This is about forgiveness at multiple levels. Now in Matthew 6, uh, 14, 15, Mark 11, 25, 26, and Colossians 3, 13, all tell us that we should forgive others in order to be forgiven ourselves. Forgiveness is often hard because we're human and, and sinful. Sometimes we have to forgive the same persons, including ourselves, for the same thing over and over again. And in this regard, it's very important to note that forgiving someone is not the same as accepting their evil actions. In this regard, just remember Jesus and the money changers in the temple. So what is God's solution for how we deal with love, forgiveness, and prayer? Because of God's great love for us, He saves us by letting His Son die for our sins. In Ephesians 2, 4 we read, But God, who is rich in mercy, because of His great love that He had for us. Unlike humanity, God has a completely different nature. God is love unlimited. 1 John 4, 8 says, The one who does not love does not know God, because God is love. Love is one of God's intrinsic attributes, but when this love is applied to sinners, it becomes grace and mercy. It comes as a shock to some of us when we discover that we're not saved by God's love, but by God's grace and mercy. In His mercy, He does not give us what we deserve, and in His grace, He gives us what we do not deserve. That grace comes through His kindness, personified by His Son, Jesus Christ. What was the kindness that God expressed to us? It was forgiveness. We don't deserve His forgiveness, but God is loving and therefore He forgives. There is only one suitable response to this kind of love. We are unable to produce the work that can solve our problem. Instead, our response needs to be that we accept God's gift. But when it comes to Jesus, people tend to hesitate because Jesus consumes our entire life but He just wants to work through us and change us. He wants to do good works through us here on earth. We need to remember God is about mercy. He forgives everything without limit. He forgives flaws out of His love. The key truth here is that God is infinite love. He relates to us because of His mercy and grace, and one of the forms it takes is forgiveness. When Jesus died on the cross, God, who is love, related that love through mercy and grace. That mercy and grace showed up in the forgiveness. Our debt was paid. God didn't need to pay that debt, for we are children of wrath. God could easily have said that you and I need to pay up. But He didn't do that. Instead, He was forgiving. But don't think that this forgiveness was easy for God, for it cost Him His Son. Forgiveness from God took on an infinite price. Charles Stanley, pastor of the First Baptist Church in Atlanta, states the following about God's motivation for His forgiveness. The motivation for God's forgiveness lies totally within God Himself. He forgives us because He wants and chooses to forgive. God forgives out of His unconditional, eternal love. John tells us that God's very nature is love, and forgiveness flows from His nature. We are forgiven because it is God's will to forgive. Forgiveness is so much needed in our society. Forgiveness is something that Christians should exercise freely. We are amazed at the number of Christians who don't even forgive each other. 
We are children of wrath before Jesus, Jesus came. Why are we still acting like children of wrath? Why are we lashing out at one another? Why are we still bitter at one another, or, or even when we say we are Christians? If we're, not cho if we're choosing not to forgive someone, then it means that we're holding on to sin in our life about that person. We can't forgive someone, then the problem is with us. It means one of two things. First, we're holding on to part of our lost nature that we never gave up, in which case we are never going to see God work in our life to help. We're never going to see God's good purpose. Second, we are lost, we are in denial, we're absent, and we're dead. Disobedient, depraved, doomed, and we're just denying it. Our heart is so hard and bitter that we are incapable of changing. Forgiveness is hard for many people, but it shouldn't be. The reason we can't forgive is because we're still letting Satan, the, the world and our sinful nature, influence us, and it owns us. Many of us are no different than the lost. We give lip service to Jesus, and the truth is that we don't really want to live like Him. We just don't want to forgive. Edward Welch, in his book Running Scared, Fear, Worry, and the God of Rest, states the following about forgiveness. We know that our forgiveness is fully dependent on God's mercy, but once we have tasted forgiveness, we too will forgive. If we're reluctant to forgivers, we simply don't know God's forgiveness. Similarly, if we have known peace, we will be peacemakers. And as we have heard it said, beating yourself up doesn't make you a fighter. Forgiving, forgetting, and moving on does. Here we can go back to the beginning of Christianity and ask the question, what did it mean to be Christian in the early church? We might answer that first a Christian was one who accepted the good news of Jesus Christ, and second a Christian was one whose life was changed by that good news and who went on to act on that good news. Another important question quite naturally flows from the first, what is the good news? When we come to that question, we might think about how we must, as Christians, live in love and be willing to forgive. So there we have the answer. Love and forgiveness is the good news. Now, who do we suppose might have given us such an answer? Who could answer the question, what is the good news, succinctly and completely? And the answer here is someone who has accepted the good news, whose life has been transformed by the good news, and who acted on the good news. However, we think it's important occasionally for Christians to reflect together and to give thanks to God for the saints and angels in our midst so that we might appreciate their place as part of God's grace and that we might learn from them and emulate them. Can we come to a more complete understanding of what it means to live, to love, forgive, and pray? May we struggle with and discern in fear and trembling whom we are to love and how we are to love. May we all find a way to define forgiveness and to practice it on, on others and on ourselves. May we all find more effective ways to define and to practice prayer. May we allow others to love us and be humble enough, enough to accept the forgiveness of others. Martin Bell in his book Distant Fire said, the good news is that no one is expendable and the task of witnessing the good news belongs to the whole community but it is not enough to proclaim the word within the church. Enabled by grace, we are to carry the word to every last man, woman, and child on the face of the earth. We carry the word back into the world that has beaten us down. We're servants charged with telling a story to people everywhere, whether or not the story has been told before, whether or not the individual believes anything, whether or not the person can ever hear the words we speak. If we accept this good news to love and to forgive, and if our lives are transformed by that good news, and we actually start living, loving our neighbor as ourselves and forgiving others as we long for God to forgive us, then we will certainly be anxious to tell others about this marvelous, marvelous adventure. So to conclude, there's only two, there's really no dilemma. It actually doesn't matter from a spiritual standpoint whether loving or forgiving comes first because in the end we must do both. But from a human standpoint, it can make a difference because for some of us it may be easier to love someone after we have forgiven them, but for others of us it may be just the reverse, and for them it may be easier to forgive someone if they first love that person. Also, for some of us, praying for a person first may make it easier both to love them and to forgive them. 
Anyway, we still have to do both and perhaps all three. And there are quite likely times when we need to love, forgive, and pray for ourselves as well as for others. Here we should remember Matthew 5, 44, where Jesus said, But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them who despitefully use you and persecute you. So it may be that praying without ceasing is even better advice for some of us who wish and need to love and forgive others as well as ourselves. Again, what about the love forgiveness dilemma? Scripture tells us we must do both. Jesus said the first and second great commandments, greatest commandments are love God and love others. And he also said we must forgive others in order to be forgiven. So in the end, it really doesn't matter to our Lord which one we do first. However, it may be easier for some of us to love than forgive, and it may be easier for others for, to forgive and then love. But when it's especially hard to love and forgive, prayer must be the first, best, and final answer. Also today, we might ask the question, can hate actually be a winning strategy after all? But Scripture tells us we're, we are to hate one thing in particular, and this one specific thing is called evil. We, re, we read in Psalm 97.10, You that love the Lord hate evil. He preserves the souls of His saints. He delivers them out of the hand of the wicked. And also in Proverbs 8.13, which says, The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogance, and the evil way, and the perverse mouth do I hate. And now in closing, we wish to pray this prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for all you have done for us. Forgive us for all of our sins. Be the Lord of our lives. Create in us a clean heart and do the right spirit within us. Renew our minds. Heal us from the hurts of our past. Teach us to love, to forgive, and to pray, and teach us to hate evil. We pray for you to bless, protect, comfort, and calm every single living being in your wonderful infinite creation from the smallest living cell to the largest living animal and living plant. Merciful Lord, please calm our fears and worries and ease our pain and anxieties. And we pray for you to help every living being that has a soul to place, keep, and strengthen their spiritual relationship with you, Lord, as their very highest ultimate priority. Help us to remember, not our will, but your will be done. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And so may it be.